Yes, uh, Ronan, we are live now. Right. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fourth combined IAA IOA 360 degree webinar. And uh, I'd like you welcome all of you who are here this evening. We'll be discussing a very common topic, uh, hip dislocations. And uh, this is the bugbear of uh, most of us who do hip surgery. We've got a Excellent panel here to discuss the pros and cons of. I think for some reason, uh, Ronan got disconnected. Uh, Ajit, you would like to uh, uh, carry on? Maybe you yeah. can welcome on behalf of Ronan. Yeah, sorry, sir. There's some technical hitch there. So, on behalf of the Indian Arthroplasty Association and the Indian Orthopedic Association, it's uh, our uh, privilege and pleasure to invite you all for this uh, webinar. And uh, without much ado, um, I hand you over to the uh, convener for this evening. Uh, it's Dr. Anil. The topic has already been mentioned. Uh, it's the dislocations post THR, one of the major problems that uh, uh, have has major consequences both in terms of uh, managing the patient as well as uh, um, the economic impact on the patient. I think Dr. Yeah. Ronan is back. If you wants to yeah. say something, thank you, Ajit. Uh, Ronan, you like to? Uh, I mean, just go ahead. Right. Thank you, Ronan. So this uh, webinar's uh, uh, convener is Dr. Anil Luman from Velour. Uh, and uh, Dr. Anil has chosen the faculty and the subject very carefully, which is a, a subject of common importance for almost all the orthopedic surgeons. Even if somebody is doing a bipolar hip arthroplasty and not a regular arthroplasty, even for them, it is a very important subject. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Anil Luman to carry it forward. Anil. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Thank you, Dr. Ronan, and uh, everyone for giving us the opportunity. I think this is a very important topic, and the minute uh, dislocation is mentioned, or even a call we get for one of our patients saying their hip is dislocated, whether it's a hemi or a total, it's truly a humbling experience, and we set our minds thinking, we are on, on literally on all fours thinking what went wrong and what could have gone wrong. And I think it's a humbling experience for everyone, no matter how experienced or how uh, senior we are, we always go back and think what we could have done better or what could have happened, what could have gone wrong and what we didn't actually analyze. So I thought this was the best opportunity to get some very good senior faculty on board. And uh, I'm glad that in spite of a last minute request, Dr. Suri, who uh, will be able to, you know, put a good introduction like the opening batsman to this topic, a good crisp view of what is dislocations and what is this thing. I thought there's an app choice I hand it over to Dr. Suri to give our opening talk on dislocations in total pathoplasty. Over to you, sir. And thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Anil. Thank you, IOA. Thank you, the Indian Arthroplasty, Dr. Rajiv, Dr. Ronan, Dr. Ajit. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be asked to set the ball rolling here. I'm just sharing the screen at this time. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet, sir. Okay. There I'm doing Is it fine? Yes. Uh, yes, it is. Yes, okay sir. Now. Yes, yes, sir. Please, please put slideshow and go ahead, sir. Yeah, yeah. So I think the, <clears throat> the topic given to me was dislocation after total hip modalities, possible causes, and intraprosthetic dislocation, which is the new mantra we have to start addressing it too easily. We all know about what are the at-risk group for instability and dislocations. I mean, commonly we talk about the standard elderly, the high BMI, cognitive dysfunction. And the newer consideration, which is now slowly getting better and better understood, are the spinopelvic considerations. I think we can't escape it today that every hip done, I think one should have some data about the standing lateral, standing flexion extension issues, etc. So far as the neuromuscular issues and the post-op protocol, gender, etc. is concerned, if you would scan the literature, the evidence is mixed. 
But one thing that is remember, the punch point here is that the re-revision for instability following revision for in, uh, dislocations is 35% over 15 years. So I think it is a constant worry. It is not immediate. We all talk about the immediate dislocation, but what happens down the line again is as important. Following multiple procedures for the hip again, the dislocation rate jumps extremely high. So almost very important is identifying the cause of instability and dislocation. The easiest is to identify the component malpositions and the standard issues. But I think one needs to be more precise now. It is not just hip alignment, component position, length and offset. I think it becomes extremely important. Impingement, I think it comes early or over the, during the course. Contractures and laxities, if you see the neuromuscular issues. Most important, abductor discontinuity or abductor injuries and its function or dysfunction and the spinal pelvic issue. So we'll address one aspect after the other. I'm taking certain things for granted because I think we have an audience probably that dwells worst with all the other basic data. The surgical approach affect the total hip. This was probably a point of discussion earlier on, but today I think this is done and dusted. And we know that all the approaches have similar dislocation rate. And so follow the road that is familiar to you. You don't have to specifically change your approach patterns uh, just because you want you are scared or you are concerned about dislocation. Of course, anterior lateral approaches come. The direct anterior is now there available for us. And they have this. <clears throat> One thing important to understand, dislocation is a permanent risk in the life of both the patient and the prosthesis. This is just a classic example. This is a 23-year-old lady post total hip, 23 years later, 78 at this time. The cup was not a very highly uh, well placed, but it was slightly abduct, uh, adducted. It was a 28 head. She continued though for 28 years, and after that, she dislocated. What was the cause for the dislocation? It is besides what we is obvious, what we see. It is also important over a period of time that is recruitment of other causes like weakening of the muscular tone, penetrative wear in the poly, especially the conventional poly besides the rheumatoid. So these things get recruited over a period of time and that can contribute to the dislocation. Another small example in this case, this is a 73-year-old lady, 17 years post-injury. This was a serious 300 euro lock cup, which I think done in some, somewhere else in Mauritius, somewhere. But then she came at every time she got up, she was dislocating. And if you look at it, what was happening basically in her was that when she starts and then the hip just impinges, the neck impinges over the anterior part of the neck and this dislocates. See the slide lower down and you realize that there has been some penetrative wear. There is a, a gap and the proximal medial migration. And this probably what leads to your early impingement with this short neck 28 head. So this penetrative wear and impingement, of course, was a concern a lot in the earlier conventional poly with the 28 and 22 heads. But probably we are out of all this, hopefully, with the use of larger heads and the crosslink polyethylene. Maybe less of a worry, but it is a mechanism that is what is concerned here. And all that this lady required, even at 17 years, was just change the cup, the poly, and this time I was fortunate that we were able, the deputy was able to supply us with a 36 liner and with a 36 head. And you find the stability is extended, the range of motion extended, and the joint was stable. So this is, a, so long as you dissect the cause of the dislocation, I think we are in a safe ground. We exactly know what we need to address too. Maximize the head side is the one lesson that we learned from the previous case because the lower cumulative risk of dislocation over the long and a better impingement function is much higher. And the current crosslink polys enable us to get a larger head even in the smaller outer diameter of the cups, depending upon the industry partner you use. You can <coughs> get. But does that mean the large head allows us to malposition socket? Certainly no, because this can again impinge at various points. So large head is no substitute for malalignment. This is for the people who think that the dislocation will be less just because you put a large head. It's a no-no. I think the basic fundamentals do not change. Your alignment positioning has to be exactly the same what you do for this case. One point additional is in the revision scenario when we use a larger and larger cups, what sometimes we call the jumbo cups. I put that word small because I think it is just a relative term. It truly is not an implant or a size. The jumbo cups defined in literature is not true in the Indian scenario because our outer diameters is not 62 and 66. 66. <coughs> 
when you have this oversized cups what happens inf- invariably is the inferior part impinging either on the sovas sovas tendinitis and the chronic pain or impingement at that spot and this can be a serious cause for dislocation so be aware of this case of this issue when you take probably you may need to abduct the cup a little more and avoid too much of a extension on the inferior side so talking about impingement what you have to clearly understand it's a terminal mechanism in many situations it is not the sole cause but it could be a mechanism at various points during the life of the processes it could be between the components malposition or a very poor head neck ratio design in the in the design it could well be also the osteophyte cementophyte pelvic impingement soft tissue impingement mechanism so, in many situations so all this it is the one thing we need to get it clear at the end of our trial implant or the final implant is assess for intraoperative stability that is hip adduction and knee flexion that is the typical position which you take in the lateral functional position sleeping in the lateral position that there is no adduction or impingement on the anterior inferior side hip abduction external rotation get off the car this is the position you take when you swing your leg out so make sure there is no abduction between the tip of the trochanter and the superior part of the acetabulum flexion internal rotation again when you crouch down to where again you should not have any impingement that is on the anterior inferior side it could also be a soft impingement here deep hip flexion getting up from the low seating again we have got to be uh, careful that we don't have any again the anterior soft or a hard impingement as as a lesser trochanter to the ischial tuberosity impingement in external rotation or the capsule with the anterior inferior iliac spine so this is just for the technical tips or the points that we need to address when we do this mal position often probably is easier to find sometimes these mal positions can be very subtle and if so if need be i think you must resort to a ct scan identify the component alignment component position Uh, uh, like for example if you see end on on a clear ap view probably you are just neutrally verted you are not anti verted so uh, this needs to be studied better on the cp because all this will require a change this is again one case in example this uh, uh, gentleman at 10 years the stem had subsided this was a schwimmler stem which had subsided earlier on and uh, obvious is the stem subsidence as a cause of pain and she was revised and when this case was revised and it all appeared good the acetabular side was not revised uh, for reasons that it was intact and not giving any problems or no lysis but this subsequently the patient dislocated repeatedly twice in the next 3 weeks which brings us seriously to two questions address two issues that is one if you see proximally at the lumbosacral junction there is some spinal instrumentation that has been done and the acetabular side if you see the surgeon had missed it the acetabular is neutrally verted or probably slightly staring at you mildly retroverted so i think what is the lesson in this case what is these uh, analyze completely both elements do not take anything for granted don't focus only on the obvious focus on the not so obvious so i think because often times decision or dislocations are multifactorial and this is a point we need to mind bone acetabulum femur the soft tissues all across is necessary so that brings us to the question of dynamics of the socket placement the standard assumption is if you have put it in antiversion and abduction of 30 and whatever degrees with a combined antiversion of 35 i think the socket position is static and constant it is not so if you look at uh, the pelvic fixation or overall the, that is only a static position of the cup antiversion when you see the activity of crouching down in further inflection the pelvis goes into a pelvic uh, sort of a retroversion here and that will increase the antiversion in angles and if it is aligned or slightly mal aligned that could lead to probably a dislocation so pelvic motion is in changes the version and inclination at all times as the patient starts moving so i think this is a point that this is entirely a subject by itself uh, the spinal pelvic parameters and the compensatory mechanism suffice to understand that from standing to the sitting position if you see which is the commonest uniaxial movement for before besides the rotations the spine starts flexing that leads to posterior pelvic tilt that will increase the antiversion what is the role of this antiversion why should it increase because that then accommodates the thigh and the sitting position accommodate if that is the if that is going to be an anterior impingement between the obese patient between the thigh and the abdomen that can again be a source of dislocation and for the mathematics one degree increase uh, one degree increase in the pelvic tilt will be 0.7 to 0.8 of the increased functional antiversion so this is what we try to adjust it so what is suffice to say that what how can we quantify 
Radiologically quantifiable factors for mobility and stiffness look at only the pelvic plane, the anterior pelvic plane and the sacral slope. I don't want to complicate it just to make it very simple. If you have an increased posterior tilt, there is a greater antiversion is required. If the anterior tilt of pelvis decrease the antiversion. This is very, very much in a small nutshell that is much more to it than this. So, these things become important when you talk of fixed situations, so, especially orienting adjustment. Uh, there is a voice issue. <laughs> Replacement. <laughs> in in uh, uh, fixed pelvic situations, I think we need to worry about parts. study and control the... <laughs> this is one case similar in example, a tabular dislocation, fracture dislocation operated and all looked good. But in about three months time, it sort of just walked out and dislocated and was recurrently dislocating. Though the socket and the stem position seem to be in the safer zones, this was a clear example of a soft tissue instability. This is one thing which we need to worry about in the multiply operated cases, in trauma, in neuromuscular issues, that the components could be stable, well aligned, but the hip is still unstable. And this case was a partial abductor ins insufficiency, which is a common cause and sometimes can drive you, especially in multiple revisions and disruption. And this needs to be subsequently revised. I just put the clinical picture of this gentleman because he did very well. Five, for five years until, I said, just as a tribute to him because COVID took him away about a few years ago. But then with this simple reconstruction, he had done extremely well. So abducted distal issue is a factor we need to consider in erosive destructions, post-fracture and multiple surgeries, sometimes in the Harding approach, if not done appropriately, and iatrogenic cases. So these are the situations worry about dislocation. So, recurrent instability in patients uh, with uh, poor bone stock and inadequate abjective tension in tissue still remains a challenge. When you have such situations, not only the reconstruction, not only the uh, realignment, but use of system con constraints seem to be important and is the way to go today. And in fact, historically, formerly, we used to have the 22 Charlie cups. And then when they were repeatedly dislocating, we used to have a superior extension with screws. I mean, this was just a very colloquial way of doing it. But today we have the constrained liners and the dual mobilities. The dual uh, constrained liners more or less has given way to dual in most situations. Very common, it was nothing new, initially used by the French for both primary and the revisions, introduced in the late 70s. Uh, Again, was to address the dislocation, but the benefits well accepted today worldwide. And as a case example like this, when you have a total deficiency of the proximal, we have we need to add system constraints in these cases. So, abducted deficiency in megaprosthesis, large prosthetic lever arm, these subjects are propens. There is a high propensity for subluxation and dislocation. One should worry about. It. But whenever you have an additional sort of a support available or a material it's available, there's nothing like a free lunch. There is always a trade-off and somewhere it probably is going to hit you and one needs to be paused. So when you use these dual mobility systems, again, a subject in itself, just addressing the intraprosthetic issue, there are reports of the early rates of early intraprosthetic dislocation with the dual mobility, either the dislocating both with the, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the plastic liner with the head or the head coming out of the plastic and uh, initially the reported dislocation was basically because of, because of the wear of the conventional poly hopefully that is addressed with the um, cross-link polyethylene but australian registry again has shown that the just re uh, replacement or the dual mobilities have a slightly higher but if you dissect this paper what you find the increased revision, revision rates is because all these are high-risk cases so maybe universally probably it may not be the true story. So intraprosthetic dislocation is basically a wear of the third articulation. When I say third articulation, we have a convex and the concave side of the plastic which articulates on the metal shell. And then when it comes to the extremes of motion, initially you exhaust the inner movement, concave movement, and then the convex movement takes over when the neck impinges on the plastic. When that happened, this had been the source of polywear, and this could probably this has been the reason for the intraprosthetic when it slowly started wearing out, and the head escaped the uh, confines of the head. That is why today you sort of inject, literally pump the head into it. Initially, the problems are large necks, non-round surface, skirted metal heads, but these are all have been taken care of. Modern um, 
uh, dual mobilities have addressed to this chamfering, suprahemispherical coverage, and on the table, in the back table, you put the head in. So, repetitive impingement of the neck on the polyethylene rim is the main reason for the where a loss of the retentive mechanism and the femoral head escapes, and this needs to be addressed. This is one such example that we ourselves saw. That is, you see the uh, oblong shape of the poly inside. This sort of wore out, and the head escaped very easily from this, and then this dislocates. Failure of the retentive, I think the failures slowly is coming down. Use of a large head, maybe 22 or a 28 head, seems to be more appropriate with a less degree of dislocation. cross leg poly, addressing the design issues of this neck and the conducive neck designs and the constrained head capture have made this less. So in conclusion, I think talking about dislocations, restitution of ideal anatomy is very, very important. Do not use even a dual mobility or any system to compensate for the cup malposition. Fundamental is to get that aspect right. And then you use the other options to further augment the stability. The instability still remains the uh, challenge. We need to use multiple uh, options. Several surgical options are available alone or in combination. So use all this together and not one single aspect. The major influences today which can limit and avoid and to help us are the head sizes, larger head, crosslink poly, I think the uh, conventional is now out of the window, dual mobility systems in case where you find the need, the whether we should use in all cases is a big question. I think that is still open. Offset options if required is to do so that you restore the anatomy or the morphology of the system completely. Today, I think we can still use the positioning devices in difficult situations so that you can even, like with the robotic hips, you can get into where it impinges and accordingly you can reposition the cup and understanding of the surgeon experience faces. Functional impact and the spinopelvic issues today is the mantra. We need to study it more wherever there's a repeated dislocation or the potential possibility of dislocation. We need to judiciously use this appropriately in terms of realigning the the socket, and then use the other constraints possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suri, uh, for that, uh, I think, overview of the causes. And I think you mentioned very well about the intraprosthetic dislocation. I think uh, just a quick uh, addendum while Nikhil gets ready for his presentation. I think Nikhil wanted to present because he had to leave. Uh, we can take one or two questions. We have about, yeah. We can take one or two questions. Any burning questions or definitely Dr. Suri, you'll be there till the end, right? Because we will have a discussion at the end. Is that okay? Sure, sure, sure. Yes. Any burning questions? Anything right now? As Dr. Nikhil loads his presentation. Dr. Suri, quickly to ask you, what, what is the, uh, the especially the intraprosthetic type of dislocation? Are you seeing that with a particular, uh, with, with a particular set of designs or are you seeing that uh, more frequently now, uh, we have seen one. We have seen only one at this okay. time. Okay, because but even it is very, it's a very point. You have raised a pertinent point. Before every display, dual mobility is not the same. All dual mobilities are not the same. I think we need to study into what is the given, what is the bevel, and how much is the capture. What is the whether it is an extra one eighty sort of a cover over the top cover which we have. What is the material? And what is the neck type and dimension? What is offset? I think many issues. There are a lot of design issues we need to go into before just randomly taking something in. You are yes. very right. Thank you, sir. And we will carry on the discussion at the end. Now over to Dr. Nikhil, who will. Uh, Can you see my screen now, panel? Yeah, Kate, Kate. Yes, okay. yes, Nikhil, go ahead. Please, uh, okay, put in sure. a, yeah, go ahead. That's great. Uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, it's always a tough order to follow Dr. Surya Narayan. Um, this is mainly a case-based discussion. So I will look at two specific scenarios and surgical techniques where a dislocation can be solved by these two unusual um, solutions. So this gentleman had a malunited femoral shaft fracture. He was in his mid 60s and he had arthritis of the hip. The surgeon had treated the problem using a long ZMR stem, osteotomy, plating of the osteotomy at the same time, and a metal on metal hip replacement using a durom resurfacing cup. The patient did quite well with his hip for about six or seven years, but then unfortunately developed adverse reaction to metal debris. And so, 
I performed his first revision for ARMD. So when I went in, what I found is <clears throat> that the acetabulum was significantly retroverted, but he had not dislocated. What the surgeon had tried to do, or it could have been because of the rotational malunion of the femur, that the stem was very antiverted, and somehow the combined version was good enough that he did not dislocate. So when I corrected the acetabular version to what I normally put into, which is antiversion, postoperatively <clears throat> the patient started impinging in external rotation. The hip was stable during surgery, and I always check for impingement. I always check for combined version. But when he stood up, clearly it was impinging in extension, and he started dislocating quite easily. At that time, it took me a couple of um, hours to figure out what was happening. And basically, what was happening is you were getting this um, component to component and component to host impingement in external rotation. and in extension so always get a ct scan especially when you have done the hip and try and figure out what's happening and you can see on the axial scans that in external rotation the component is impinging against uh, the the socket and also against the bone so this was a challenging um, thing to sort out because that zmr stem was solidly ingrown and about 290 mm long plus the body so removing the stem would have probably ended up destroying the femur and the long extended trochanteric osteotomy so one of the uh, devices that we have on the shelf is called the bioball adapter system it is distributed by lima so what it consists of are these uh, trunnion sleeve adapters and you can get them in neutral version or you can get them so that you can antivert them up to 7 degrees change of version they can match most known uh, taper uh, combinations in the world like uh, 911 913 <clears throat> 1214 or 1416 and you have to make sure that you know the trunnion of the underlying stem and then get these trial adapters and the real adapters and then they have ceramic heads that go on their adapter so luckily we have this on the shelf and um, i was able to solve this problem by using one the bioball adapter and two what i did is the cemented liner inside the trabecular metal shell i intentionally very slightly change the version of that liner so you can see on the lateral x ray how the angle of the trunnion is seen by one of the red lines and the other red line shows the angle of the bioball 7 degree adapter and using this fairly simple solution i was able to solve the problem so this patient is now reaching 6 years uh, without any problems one of the concerns obviously is that you are increasing the number of interfaces because of the trunnion and um, this was also my concern when i did this for the first time but bioball have got data now i think more than a million of these have gone in to patients and so far there has not been any significant problems with trunnionosis or further adverse reaction to metallic debris or uh, <clears throat> corrosion issues so that was the first case the second case is this device called the posterior lick augmentation device i think dr surya narayan mentioned this briefly in his talk so i'll show you what it is so this lady was 67 years old and she came to me with an acetabulum and a femoral head fracture in 2007 this was one of my first cases of acute fix and replace so probably Uh, before even the word fix and replace was invented the problem of course that she was morbidly obese but she had a very small socket the outer diameter of the socket was only 42 now one of the things that rublevsky had manufactured at writington is this offset bore cup if you look at the axis of the hip replacement it looks as if there is inferior wear but it's not inferior wear it's just that the polyethylene is much thicker at the top of the cup than at the bottom so that the bore or the hole inside the cup is offset towards the lower part of the cup and this is a very neat solution for these tiny sockets where um where you want to use a cemented socket and you know my my primary hip replacement remains a cemented total hip replacement she was absolutely fine for 13 to 14 years 
and then she started dislocating so she developed two dislocations i thought that she might be wearing it out but there was no evidence of wear at all so i did an examination under anesthesia because she was also getting subluxation and basically what had happened is because of the loss of soft tissue tension and as you become older the muscle tone reduces there was some slackness of soft tissues now she had multiple different medical comorbidities and really uh, the anesthetist was quite concerned about her ability to tolerate a major component revision so this is where the plaid comes in in low demand patients elderly patients uh, patients who have lot of medical issues and you want a fairly quick 30 40 minute operation so she had diabetes ischemic heart disease uh, transient ischemic attacks and a variety of other problems the other issue of course was that she had a very small socket so you can't really use much of a larger head uh, none of the constrained bearings fit inside such a small socket even the g7 has got limitations and certainly even the smallest dual mobility does not fit i thought of getting a custom dual mobility manufactured but the the french company said that they were not able to manufacture such a small one because the manufacturing tolerances would not be considered safe for implantation so this was what we did this is called a posterior lip augmentation device it consists of a metallic plate uh, and then it has a polyethylene uh, um plate attached to it uh, the screw goes through the metal side and the poly touches the poly and if you see what it does is it extends your posterior wall essentially and prevents the hip from coming out by causing something that is similar to a lipped liner and you can put it posteriorly and superiorly or what you can do is during surgery check whether the hip is coming out and you can put the plaid over there now because she was slack what i did is i did it like a full ring like a circle of uh, plaid i put one plaid in the front one plaid at the back and that's how the post operative x ray looks and it was a fairly easy and a quick operation the time that is required is for you to open and close the hip and uh, to put the plaid in takes about 15 to 20 minutes per plaid and that she is at 2 years she is now 82 is a phase very happy she can look after her cat uh, she lives independently mobilizes independently and she's not had any further dislocations so in conclusion i find ct scans very useful to analyze component malpositioning i think impingement impingement is a very important um, concept and you have to really understand how impingement happens examination under anesthesia before surgery it is also very useful to look at what the stable arc of movement is in which particular direction you are getting the impingement whether it's in flexion adduction internal rotation or whether it is an extension and external rotation and that gives you a strategy to perform your revision surgery before you plan the revision it's important to understand the cause of the dislocation and to try and rectify those correctable causes that you can identify it's very 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 important to check for impingement in fact several years ago when i first understood the concept of impingement i realized that you can actually get away with mild degrees of malpositioning of the components so long as your combined version is satisfactory and you're not impinging and then all the other um, fancy or newer strategies such as dual mobility constraint bearings they can be implemented where you don't really find a correctable cause and uh, bioball and plaid are very useful devices to have in your armamentarium <coughs> when you are revising these cases thank you very much uh thanks nikhil i think uh, that is good two cases good take home messages i think uh, ajit is next on line so as ajit gets his presentation ready to ajit uh, any questions for dr nikhil because i understand nikhil has to leave will you be online or will you be leaving nikhil i'll try and join on my mobile on my hands free i've got to get to my son's okay. school okay no problem no problem any question quick question yes yes please I mean, uh, uh, the bioball concept sounds very interesting, but what was even more interesting is that it hasn't generated much metal debris. Any particular reason for that? I think the manufacturing is is probably satisfactory. One of the problems with uh, tranionosis is often what you had is large cobalt chrome heads on soft titanium stems. So with the bioball, we have not really seen that problem. and i think it has got to do with better manufacturing quality uh, better matching of the taper 
and uh, that was one of our most important concerns as far as possible we try and avoid using the buyer ball especially in young people and i prefer to use it in sort of elderly low demand people but in in a case like that to take that zmr stem out and that plate in that malunited femur i think it would have ended up destroying the whole femur really so you, it's a it's an evaluation of um, um costs and benefits to the patient you know a risk benefit analysis before you decide what you want to do i mean really bail out options in an extreme scenario <laughs> Nikhil, i think so yes correct make it just one point you knew it was a zmr before going in right you knew it was a zmr before going in any role yeah. any role for just replaced and reposition the and uh, realign the proximal bit just a so quick we question explored, we explored that and we had the kit available but okay. even the proximal bit was so solidly bonded because that would have been the, a short eto yeah so i could have done a short eto i could have used the the mechanism to take that out one of the correct. questions that we all thought is that it has been in for some while and during removal or breaking that more stapler if that trunnion is damaged then essentially you know i'm i'm stuck then i have to then i'm obliged to go sure. after the whole stem and i have seen cases where during right. removal of the more stapler the trunnion does face some damage or gets scratches and then that would probably be a much bigger problem you know so my philosophy is go for the solution that has the least risk and it has the easiest way to solve it you know when it keep it simple yeah and nikhil your one more uh, your second piece uh, yeah sure 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 go ahead you ask you when you are on the way right yes okay we well, nikhil we'll get back to you because there's some question i don't think it's available as yet in india there's some more questions that have, had, have come in the chat box and i think yeah, the yeah. first one will be for dr suri uh, to what range of motion do we check for impingement well, that we can get back going later let ajit uh, get on with this case over to dr you dr ajit yeah you can see my screen yes, yes. go ahead okay so yeah mine is a uh, uh, probably more discussion would be um, in the initial stages how to get it right maybe rather than how to solve the dislocation so going for just one moment um screen is not moving forward for some reason yeah okay so this is a 63 year old uh, male uh, this was about i think uh, almost 9 years now post uh, surgery so he had some childhood sepsis and uh, he had a uh, 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 pelvic supportive osteotomy done at that stage at that age and then uh, he was hobbling around all his life and this is how he presented with pain uh, both in the hip as well as in his lower back when he came to us and he wanted something done about it so um obviously he needs a subtrochanteric uh, shortening osteotomy to get the hip center sorted out but uh, in doing this i mean well, whatever literature that i have read or seen in the past they talk more about the nerve problems and uh, the limb length problems and hardly any literature uh, talks about uh, dislocations in this uh, particular situation so uh, can i ask the panel any experience or any thoughts on this right now or should i finish my presentation uh, you you can i think uh, because the management part of it is not a long one really any experience with the dislocations in such scenario like with the crow type 4 uh, ddh uh, uh, i i uh, think the dislocation is very is a is a big issue in these case because you have to uh, release a lot of proximal femur and most likely you have to do a subtrochanteric osteotomy for these cases so i think is is not uncommon in these situations so one has right. to be more careful in these cases than the normal okay. uh, totally actually, actually in these scenarios i think uh, krishna is also there i think in these scenarios when you do a subtrochanteric get it right the soft tissue tension is really good mm -hmm. and if you put it well and if you get the hip center also restored the dislocation rates are actually quite low in fact because the tension is so good because you have done a subtrochanteric osteotomy with to get the tension i think that's what we've seen okay right. krishna any thought one re one reason <laughs> for the panel is 
that these patients uh, uh, obviously will have will need a more care more uh, rest uh, less uh, normal functions uh, as against the normal hip arthroplasty so that is also one reason that uh, and if it is rightly cup is rightly placed the stem is rightly placed then obviously the indicate this location rate will be lower arif can i add something yes 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 uh, dr yes, anurag yeah yeah so we had one such case where he was gro- uh, patient was operated elsewhere came to us dislocated this patient had gross rotational deformity in the lower limb and this patient had a deformity in the lower part of femur as well as tibia gross exenotation deformity which surgeon did not take into consideration so so with what you said with the osteotomy subtrochanteric shortening osteotomy i think we need to take into consideration these gross rotational deformities as well so that case was solved by putting into correct rotation so the issues would yeah, be more- think rotational alignment is very important go ahead go ahead uh, dr ajit and i think sanjeev's question will take- anil sanjeev has a question i think yeah Yes, yes. I, I was saying Sanjeev will take at the end. Okay, oh, Sanjeev, go ahead, Sanjeev. Hi, Sanjeev, go ahead. Yeah, I don't have a question. I have just like basically you use the most modular implant and these kind of things, especially on the femur side. You can as you correctly say the socket is always brought down and center of rotation is maintained. But at the same time, uh, with those uh, proper modular implant, you keep it in proper position. I think chance of dislocation is practically rare. Yeah, modular implants to correct the version and everything. Go ahead, uh, Ajit. Yeah, so that's his uh, lateral view there, just to get an idea about the thing. So, yeah, went ahead and uh, did that. I'm used to using uh, this particular stem, really. So, uh, did this. He was fine, discharged on the fifth or sixth day. And then he came back for suture removal at about uh, two weeks, I think. And uh, he was due for follow-up at about uh, six weeks' time. And... Uh, yeah about a month or so after the suture removal and uh, the night before he came to me this was the situation so anything obvious on the x-ray that could have uh, been done better i'll just put up the yeah here we need to look like a so solution stem yeah yeah it is a solution and, stem sir. and it uh, it looks like a well fixed stem in the femur Mm-hmm. Mr. Fima, uh, like version uh, looks a bit iffy. I mean, I'm I'm not sure whether it's a true AP, but uh, the stem version or the cup, the cup, the cup. Yeah. cup version. Not able to comment on the stem version because uh, I'm not sure, Ajit, what the stem version was like. Because with the solution, it's I, I'm I, I'm pretty sure. What is the fit like in the proximal fragment? What is the fit like in the distal fragment? very good very tight there was absolutely no issues there and on table all the movements were perfectly stable flexion adduction uh, internal rotation external rotation all of it was very very stable what is the uh, what is the restoration of length like yeah he was uh, short by about 2 uh, cm uh, even after the uh, uh, restoration of the hip center so he was about 6 cm i think initially and uh, he ended up about 2 cm short overall dr adi did we get a ct scan done for this later on no 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 this, this is the first dislocation so the my first thought was to straight away get him to the or and reduce it you can see that the uh, osteotomy has not yet united there okay so there's no mal rotation or anything happening there so i think most of us the first dislocation that happens we would take them to the theater reduce it reassess on table uh, what's happening and uh, again i found that on table he was perfectly stable right there was no uh, in any major directions that i put the hip through he was stable and so did not do any further imaging or x rays so Yeah, just thinking what could have been the reason for that. Uh, Ajit, when you took the patient for for the reduction, open yeah. reduction of the sleeve was done. Yeah. So close did reduction. you see the, uh, it was a close reduction? Close reduction, yeah. So in the first surgery, uh, was there any impingement? No, nothing. Because of the I mean, osteophytes, no. 
nothing all that was uh, sorted out i can just go back to the picture there it was all mm-hmm. all cleared up and uh, even all the pre op yeah. there was nothing there yeah, yeah. so so you did a, you did a close reduction or open reduction doctor yes, right? close reduction it was a close reduction okay. it was very stable and okay uh, as far as i am concerned that's where the story ended because it's now 9 years post uh, uh, procedure and this is him well united hmm. this was at 10 months follow up but this was in 2014 that uh, i had done this patient so i was just wondering what could have been the reason actually what he told me was he was trying to get out of the bed and he sort of hyper extended the hip putting the leg out and that's it that's when it popped out that's what he said so so it is positional i think positional yeah, yeah. positional uh, you know dislocations are uh, usually the st- if they are stable then they continue there there should not be a problem so i just brought this up for discussion whether in these high dislocations and particularly when you do the subtrochanteric osteotomies whether there will be any issue with your soft tissue tension because your placements cup placements stem versions you're more or less okay the whether there is any uh, soft tissue tension because you are shortening as well so sometimes that can be an issue the shortening occurs in the uh, i mean we are doing the subtrochanteric osteotomy subtrochanteric correct yeah so the for essentially for the soft tissues around the hip we are restoring actually good abductor tension good uh, so soft tissue tension overall so chance of dislocation almost comes to a nil uh, I, krishna would you have anything to say add to this the procedure itself is very complicated so you can make many many mistakes with respect to the cup inclination version the way the subtrochanteric osteotomy is put back together so there is potential to make lot of errors so in that sense the uh, instability risk is higher uh, mm-hmm. and it is also a dysplastic type of scenario sometimes if it is a shans osteotomy there is a distal varizing osteotomy as professor anil arora m- mentioned which can have a torsional component to it as well and when we do surgery we do a extensive soft tissue release including iliopsoas and uh, the adductors and all these yep. are released except for the abductor everything is uh, removed so the soft tissue support as such although the soft tissue tension when you do it well is really good and i would agree with you that we have not encountered any instability if the surgery is done well the scope for making mistakes is higher and the chance for early instability in the absence of uh, special implants like you would probably now nowadays the size of the socket would be 40 42 sometimes you just have a 22 mm head and uh, despite that our own experience is that it doesn't dislocate but uh, the ch- challenge here is early precautions probably are a good idea in this sort of cases for the first couple of months till the soft tissue scarring happens because the patients really cannot control how they get out of bed and then they uh, they sit on a toilet seat and then they are getting up that is when it dislocates and 75% of them if otherwise everything is done well they don't re dislocate so 3 out of 4 they keep doing well so that's what i is my take on it i think i think that's a very very valid point dr ajit i think yeah, uh, especially dr. Ajit, okay okay uh, Dr. Sanjeev and Dr. Anil has a, uh, some uh, questions to make, and Dr. Ronan can get his presentation ready. I think he's next on the line. So by that time, yes, uh, Mohanty, you had something to say? No, no. I, I think- just wanted Dr. Ajit to mention here that uh, how to reduce a dislocated THR mm-hmm. and how long you immobilize and what is the mode of immobilization because for the benefit of the delegates. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So I mean. post op immobilization for this guy all we did was to give him a knee brace so that was easy and uh, here since there was no it's not a metal cup it is just a plastic cup and well seated there was not too much of a problem we just under relaxation gave uh, in flexion little bit of uh, traction and gently uh, abducted and internally rotated uh, that's all it went in quite easily it stayed yeah. there I think uh, good. Sanjeev, if it reduces, then uh, it is easily likely to dislocate. If it is little difficult to reduce, then probably that hip is going to be stable. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Mohanty. Yeah. No, Sanjeev, I don't. I had only one comment to make, which I did it. Yes, Sanjeev. Yeah, I had only one comment to make. I I did that. 
Okay, very good. Okay, Anil, uh, Dr. Anil Arora, anything to no, say? No, no. Yeah, just uh, yeah. he has already already answered. Yeah, post op management. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Right. And I think just I think the take home would be I think like Krishna pointed out, Najit pointed out. After a subtrochanteric osteotomy, I think it's better to be careful for the first few months, especially till the fracture unites and the soft tissues are allowed to heal. But otherwise, well done. I think that's a point well taken. Thank you. Over to Dr. Ronen. Right. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Please go ahead, Dr. Ronen. Right. Uh, well, I've got a relatively uh, simple case. This is a 73-year-old lady. She was immobile following a domestic fall about six months ago. And uh, she was actually admitted at the time in a neurosurgical hospital in a drowsy condition where she was diagnosed to have a bilateral subdural hematomas, which were decided to be treated conservatively. And she was also diagnosed to have Parkinson's disease at the time. So this was diagnosed six months ago and treatment was started. And while she was recovering, she had other medical issues, which were really her major problem. She had hypertension, dyslipidemia, type 2 diabetes, interstitial lung disease, chronic liver disease, urinary incontinence with recurrent UTIs, and a bifascicular heart block to add to all the chaos that was prevailing. And uh, before discharge from the hospital, after her conservative treatment, she wasn't able to walk and she was beginning to complain of pain in her left hip. And that's when the in-house orth <coughs> orthopedic surgeon saw, saw her and uh, decided in view of her multiple com comorbidities and the fact that the neurosurgical team did not give the uh, clearance to operate, she was decided to be treated conservatively at the time and she was discharged home. And previous to that, her, her bipolar had been done in November 2018. So that's about five years earlier. And she had an uncemented bipolar hemiarthroplasty, and she was well till her fall in March. And she had a subsequent fall again in September 2020, when she had a, a fracture of the left neck of humerus, which was treated with a free loss. And during that time, treatment of her osteoporosis was started with denosumab injections, calcium and vitamin D. And she presented to us in end August 23, uh, immobile since her last fall in March, that's about six months ago. Neurologically, she was much better. Uh, she was a very pleasant lady given her age and, every, and all her multiple medical issues. And her main problem was she was having difficulty in sitting due to the prominent bipolar head in her left gluteal region. And uh, uh, honestly, giving her colorful medical history, I really wasn't very keen on doing a surgery. But patients and relatives wanted a solution and were willing to accept any surgical and non-surgical risks, into, including death on the table. So given that sort of scenario, I referred her to the internal medicine team, the gastro team, the pulmo team, cardiology team, the urology team, and the neurosurgical team. And that's the problem of working in a tertiary center. Everyone gave clearance with high risk. And uh, the only other additional thing was that she was advised a preoperative pacing and uh, existing UTI was treated and she was deemed fit for surgery. So these are her x-rays. And uh, my question before you is, uh, what do you think has happened and uh, how would you manage? I think it's uh, open to the house, I think. Uh, Yes, I mean, uh, anyone willing to take it on? Is there a greater it is, uh, <coughs> the greater Tokantar is not seen here. Correct. The greater Tokantar is not seen. Well picked up, Subhangshu. Anything else? I think Maybe the third is... X-ray, you can see it is flying away near the bipolar cup. Correct. And next, we uh, have to see version of the stem also. Uh, that will be more apparent in a CT scan, but... Uh, and the acetabulum looks a uh, little uh, posterior leap of oh. the acetabulum. Doubt uh, whether there is a, you know, acetabulum looks a little vertical to me. Now, how many months since the dislocation run in? Six months, March. In fact, she presented just about four weeks ago. Abductor dissociation is one issue we have to keep in mind. Right. So, I think uh, you've picked up all the orthopedic issues. And... Uh, well done, Shubrangshu. And basically, there's acetabular erosion. And along with that, the GT was avulsed. 
and you can spot the GT lying there just behind the head superiorly. And the CT scan actually confirmed that. The version was actually okay, though I don't have the transverse CT scans with me at the moment. Her blood was otherwise normal, uh, uh, complete blood count, ESR and CRP, and the urine showed no growth after treatment. So the question is, what are the, what are the plans, what's the options, what are the pros and cons? And this is a lady who you really want to do a minimum because the, surg the anesthetists were not keen on any prolonged anesthetic. So should we try and reduce, convert to a THR? Is an ETO possible in this patient? Reduce and fix the GT, maintain the stem, what would you like to do? Uh, I would convert to a totally replacement with dual mobility top. Uh, stem is, uh, version is good, then with that stem, can uh, go at uh, doing a dual mobility cup. Yeah, and also and at the, the same time, fix the uh, greater yeah. trochanter also. Greater trochanter, yeah. 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 Uh, how, how would you fix the greater trochanter? Uh, well, well, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll fix it with the, uh, you know, uh, ideally, uh, you know, uh, K-word, tension band wiring, but uh, when, uh, to have a better fixation, you can use a greater trochanter plate as well. Right. Well, we uh, decided that we'd maintain the stem because uh, the three-phase bones can actually show that there was no evidence of loosening. And uh, to do an ET on this lady would have been actually, uh, there would be very little left of her bone. So we checked for the taper, made sure that we had the correct size taper available for the head. And we just did an exchange and this is what we did. And uh, we managed to retain the head, 28, uh, 44 millimeter cup. 28 millimeter head with a matching taper, cup slightly closed and antiverted to try and make sure that we got as much cover as possible. We reopposed the GT with three separate fiber wires, two, two number two fiber wires, and an adductor tenotomy was done because she had quite a strong adductor moment and the uh, adductors were quite tight. We managed to get reasonable tension and appeared quite stable on the table, but given her neuromuscular disorders, we decided to play it safe. And at the moment, she, this is her in bed in the ICU. She's developed a post-operative UTI for which she's undergoing treatment. And this is pictures from three days earlier. So uh, my question is, when would you like to mobilize her? And when would you think would be safe to mobilize her? I mean, the last thing that I want is for her to dislocate again. <laughs> this would have been better of prepared <laughs> to start with because it was a uh, multifactorial dislocation. So this is one indication for a, a dual mobility uh, to start with. 28 right. millimeter head no, uh, with the GT uh, deficiency, then now the risk of re-dislocation could be higher, especially considering her age and situation. And was there any cough? Think, uh, sorry? Dual so mobility, of course, deficiency? like... Krishna says is a mandatory thing and yes. then addressing the abducted deficiency, which is the biggest worry now. In addition, I Correct. think probably a glute max partial transfer would have been more appropriate to augment this. Fiber wires are not going to hold it, you know, and it will yeah. take a long time for it to uh, uh, sort of fibrose itself. Give it adequate time. If you have to immobilize now or in this position, at least about six weeks, four to six weeks. That's and that what my again. plan was as well, six yeah. weeks. Uh, but that's again not good for the chest and for this elderly lady after a long surgery. Uh, Suri, just a quick, uh, can I ask you, especially what, what it's a six month old dislocation, right Ronin? Correct. Yeah. So the challenges in bringing down this for Krishna also, yes, your point well taken, it should have been a dual mobility. To bring down that big and abduct, uh, greater trochanter chunk, would yeah. you think it would be, uh, what, I mean, like the challenges for that? The precisely, that's what I'm saying. You can't bring it down. You won't get approximation, osteopenic bone, fiber wire will be floating in the soft tissues. Augmentation is the way to go in these cases. There are two ways you could do the glute max, which is described. The second one is just bring down the whole composite fibrous mass down and then reattach with probably something like a Marlex mesh spacer. That's what I do into a couple, a couple of situations because this Marlex mesh, which is the hernia repair uh, go-to, 
induces intense amount of fibrosis. Fibrosis, yeah. Yeah. So that fibrosis will be then the continuum between the muscle fibers proximally and the trochanteric area distally. And uh, that probably that healing which happens is more robust than just a primary fixation. And how much time would that take? Again, it takes about, in, in fact, the gentleman I showed walking, he had the similar one, six, four months dislocation. The healing probably will take at again about two to three months. It's not going to be easier. Early. Actually, if you do that in combination with the dual mobility, that will take care. Yes. yes, I think we need to recruit uh, all the possibilities to add up to this. So I Krishna is ready for your presentation. Krishna is next while we take on the next few questions. Uh, Krishna uh, gets uh, ready. For sorry, us. I have a question. Uh, Ronan, uh, yeah. Uh, Ronan, yeah, the, uh, what about the use of the constraint liner and allow this patient to be? Well, the unfortunate. So I'll be showing the uh, the one case for the same. We wanted to do a, use a constraint liner, but unfortunately, with the forty-four cup, they didn't have a, a matching constraint liner. It started from forty-six. <laughs> So th that was the issue that we had on the table. In fact, that's what the original plan was. With the fresh cup constraint liner doesn't seem very. Can I make a comment, Anil? Yes, 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 yes. Can please I? go. Sorry, I can't. Yeah, sorry, I'm on my hands free. Just no, one no. comment about the constraint constraint liner. Go ahead, yes, Nikhil. Nikhil. Yes. Nikhil, go ahead. No problem. We can hear you. He's Hello? on the road. Yeah, so yes, the forces are very moving. When you put a, neuro, a constraint liner, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Loud and clear. We seem to be losing you yeah. in between. So when you put a constraint liner and if you put an in inner... Yeah, sorry, I'm on my hands free. That's why. It's okay. I'll, I'll try and park later on and make my comment at the end. You go ahead. Well, I have a question to Suri. Where do you put this mesh? You put it in the gap in the bone or in the yeah. muscle? In the in between the soft tissues. Whatever tissues are there, you just take it along and then wrap it around. You take you fold it three to four times. So it becomes like a cord. And then you just dig it, uh, repair it, you, repair it, you push it to the bone. And you know, into the soft tissue itself also is fine. If you have some bone to fix it, fantastic. Okay. See, so suppose you got the distal stump of the tissue attached to the. Uh, in this case, you won't have it. So just take some transosseous sutures, fix it up, rotate all the tissues, and suture it out. Okay. I mean, this is a cheap, but straightforward, simple. Yeah, case. I think uh, we can try it next time. <laughs> we'll we'll discuss. We'll take. I think so. Yes. I, I'll, I'll, I'll report in six weeks. Sure. Definitely. Yes. Okay, Doctor. Okay, so Dr. Krishna and up next is Dr. Rajiv followed by Arun Kanen. Yes, Krishna, go ahead. Can you see my slide? Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, this is the case of well. unusual uh, hip dislocation. I think uh, you can take it slowly uh, mm -hmm. because just a single case. Uh, so this was a 39-year-old lady and she was a Caucasian lady and she had this problem on the left hip, mild pain and you know probably a uh, grade 1 dysplasia or something like that and she went and got a hip replacement done for this particular problem and somebody did a uh, direct anterior approach hip and post-surgery there was a 3 centimeter lengthening of the leg and the leg was entirely abducted and she was unhappy with the hip and it got it revised 2 years later and developed habitual hip dislocation. So, this is what was done. Uh, the This is the revision. So, this is the stage uh, with which she presented to me and she didn't have previous x-rays. So, she had undergone an isolated cup revision and uh, the leg for her appeared to be longer uh, and she had this sort of a situation. Every time she had to lie down or sit she had to dislocate her hip and then every morning she would relocate it and walk on it. And uh, this is the situation with which she presented to us. She had a fixed adduction deformity of the uh, lower extremity about 30-35 degrees and about uh, 1 or 2 centimeters of lengthening of the left leg and she was very unhappy and ESR-CRP was normal. So I think uh, 
anybody can take take this up what would yes krishna right uh, uh, okay we we'll, yeah any any takers so you said the primary hip was done and then she well, went on to was not indicated with the hip was not indicated right. was the correct x ray and she was uh, and the revision was for the lengthening correct so the patient had lengthening and always had to walk with the hip abducted and okay. uh, uh, what happened was somebody in the interim we did an abductor release for her uh, abductor release abductor release because there, there was abduction contracture of the hip and then she started where did uh, you do that release at the crest or uh, at request because the hip was abducted she was unhappy patient no uh, was it at the iliac crest it's also a little bit abnormal uh, she's uh, she had come from some other place she was very highly anxious strung and uh, uh, different so she underwent that abductor release and then started dislocating and somebody revised it and then she developed an adduction contracture and recurrent uh, habitual dislocation that means every time she sat down and uh, had to sleep she had to dislocate her hip and in the morning her sister would help her to relocate the hip so that she could walk around and she walked with that leg being completely adducted so question is uh, krishna no, this uh, that means the abductors are compromised right in this yeah, yeah, uh, you can see the uh, the yes the gt area is correct a little bit yeah bald and so, krishna know. one question uh, yes, this sir. patient seems to be having a uh, significant adduction adduction contracture yes, yes sir that is yeah. so so um, that seems to be the one of the reason why this patient is having dislocation yeah that is oh. true and if we also look at the uh, pre operative uh, the x ray on the opposite side and look at the relationship between the center of the femoral head and the tip of the trochanter yeah so the vertical offset is very uh, yeah significantly valgus and uh, over lengthened on the femoral side and if you look at the cup uh, inclination whatever is the cage that was put in this seems to be a little bit more vertical than what would be accepted yeah right so, but uh, the, the issue is so there is the issue there vertical of uh, basically yeah yeah increase go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No. and uh, there is a you know sort horizontal offset and with a vertical cup the cage might be you know put in position whatever position but at least the you no know, liner or whatever has been put inside that should have been given adequate inclination and diversion uh, it looks vertical so but mohanty we won't be able to comment on the liner correct we won't be able to comment on the poly position right mohanty yeah, poly this is a lima uh, trabecular metal cage okay uh, that is not available in india but it okay. is a triple modular type of device you have a cage ring with a metal shell which gets in uh, locked into it with a bolt and then you have a polyethylene liner which has got a 20 degree phase changing so you can change the version inclination with the polyethylene so it's a three set uh, process one pre coated cage then you have a metallic ring inside and uh, uh, this thing uh, the poly liner which has got 0 10 20 degrees of uh, version uh, options where you can uh, change the version based on whatever is the requirement Uh, the uh, head was a 32 mm uh, head and we saw the bio ball by dr nikhil uh, a little while earlier so this is the implant which is manufactured by the same company lima hmm. so krishna this uh, seems to be having all the uh, uh, elements for this adduction contracture the uh, soft tissue laxity and also the uh, the wrong inclination of the cup so so what have you done from this yeah so this is a case where you, you are, your etiology of instability is multifactorial you have acetabular cup malform malposition is a type 1 problem you have a femoral issue which is a type 2 problem you have abductor insufficiency which is a type 4 problem and probably some uh, unknown etiology as well with respect to the uh, thing and this is what is the situation so she had this uh, completely adducted limb with some pelvic obliquity and then the equinus at the ankle but if you look at the leg length measurement then the leg length measurement was not too far off and whenever she lay down she had to dislocate the hip you can see it's adducted flexed and internally rotated so this was a challenging case for us and we uh, 
decided to do a both component revision and uh, when we uh, exposed the hip initially we retained the stem and then this is the uh, cup inclination you can see is around 56 degrees and the version effective version was around 4 degrees of anti version using this uh, uh, mobile based uh, device the inclination is more accurate than version version sometimes depends upon how the <laughs> pelvis is flexed or extended so you cannot be 100% sure so we got the polyethylene liner and the things out but we were not able to remove this shell because it is tm coated and it was fully ingrown so uh, the position of the shell was around 56 60 degrees of inclination so we did needed to do something so what we decided to do was uh, we wanted to do a dual mobility cemented cup and since this shell was not uh, a, a sort of a trabecular metal coated on the inside i used a tm augment to close that cup down and have some fixation for the uh, dual mobility cup as well and then we uh, fix that augment to the cage with two screws and cemented a dual mobility liner in around 30 degrees of 30 33 degrees of uh, intraoperative inclination and then 20 degrees of uh, anti version and then we changed the stem as well so we did a limited slot femoral osteotomy so we just split open the linea aspera putting a prophylactic wire just below below the uh, where the coating ends so and then we can uh, safely remove the stem without having to do an extended trochanteric osteotomy and we change the neck shaft angle and also the length uh, to more uh, anatomic uh, as for that particular patient and this was the combined anti version so we used around 8 degrees of version on the femur and got a 28 degrees of combined anti version and used a dual mobility shell with a ceramic on highly crosslinked polyethylene liner and that's the immediate uh, post operative x ray you can see that we have restored the relationship of the center of the femoral head to the tip of the trochanter and also the uh, length of that leg has been restored and uh, this is a follow up at 10 months where everything has healed up but the patient still is not happy with her uh, surgery she says that uh, she read too much up on the internet and she says i need some shortening of the femur this that but currently the hip is located and she is able to manage so that is the uh, case i just uh, brought out this uh, algorithm as a take home that if you have a primary thr and it's a first dislocation must do a close reduction that was shown by uh, dr ajit and then you do bracing and it is successful in 3 out of 4 cases that is 75% and if it is unsuccessful you must rule out infection and find the cause it could be component malposition in which case you do a appropriate procedure in the form of bio ball and liner exchange as was shown or a full component revision you could have soft tissue laxity which can be uh, will lead to impingement and a combination of soft tissue laxity with abductor insufficiency which can be managed by using increased neck length lateralized liners larger head sizes and sometimes the etiology is multifactorial unknown or uh, this sort of a situation where it is habitual where you are trending more towards a constrained liner or a dual mobility uh, uh, cup more uh, often nowadays and sometimes a girdle stone may be the only choice we have uh, in patients who are unhappy with their surgery or we are not able to solve the problem thank you thanks krishna for that uh, very challenging case uh, just a quick comment rajiv uh, can you uh, would you get ready for the presentation dr rajiv while uh, we take a couple of questions i think Krishna, just a quick question. Uh, you said the trabecular metal cage itself did not, uh, you know, yield because uh, it was not uh, budging from that place. One yeah. one question is basically what what was the size of the uh, cage? You, do you do you have a? I mean, did you read off that or what is the size of the cup that you took it out? A, it was a fifty four uh, tm cage. Okay, so my question is: Is fan of these custom made implants and these cages for the same reason? That sure. you are having to do some sort of a revision procedure on them, then it is a big nightmare if it gets big infected. Nightmare, or, you know. No, but yeah. I, I mean I like the way that uh, you put in the uh, the trabecular metal on because that is trabecular metal on, so you don't have an issue with metal on metal or a two different uh, metal combination because both are trabecular metal based, right? That, that is true. Uh, 
but since it is all unitized with cement uh, i'm not again a fan of uh, uh, stand alone metal backed cemented cups because the uh, literature has shown that these have got very poor outcomes so if you just put in a, a blob of cement with a metal back uh, uh, all cemented the metal back cup they don't really do well so you must use a combination of a cage with some sort of a trabecular metal augmentation whenever we are using these devices because it's a young patient and uh, yes. there is no other option for this patient so the other option would have been to cement a constraint liner uh, into this uh, cage and the uh, tm construct which we considered but uh, we were able to uh, get away with a dual mobility having looked at how the constraint liners will have i think that that would have been the first choice yeah correct So what do you Thanks, do? Krishna. Over to Dr. Rajiv. Yeah, uh, please reserve your questions for the end. I think Party has a question. We'll have. We'll take questions later. Over to Dr. Rajiv. Rajiv, you are muted. Can you unmute yourself, Dr. Rajiv? Dr. Rajiv, you are muted. Uh, can you hear me yeah now now yes yeah. now yes yeah. please yeah. go ahead thank you anil uh, wonderful cases uh, for uh, very difficult situations uh, i'll i'll uh, show two types of situations where the constraint liners are and where the dislocation of the constraint liner itself uh, is managed uh, now this patient who's a 80 year old male fell on the floor and fractured his uh, tr- left trochanter and for this uh, uh, we did the bipolar uh, hip arthroplasty and that is the two weeks uh, post operative x ray and the pictures and this patient was doing well and uh, then after uh, this patient had a fall uh, and which was reduced and then after the patient had a uh, again fall so there were there were the three occurrences of that dislocation and reduction of this patient Uh, and we can see here uh, which uh, that trochanter is not very well placed now uh, because of the recurrent dislocations uh, so broken in this uh, due course of time uh, so would somebody like to take on that uh, what will be the advice at this stage uh, anil or, or do i just go on you i think uh, dr rajiv you just go on i think we will uh, comment at the end i think for want of time so, i think so we have a good discussion at the end patient, so yeah this thanks so much the, this patient uh, was old and uh, we wanted to ensure that the patient is on his feet uh, at the earliest possible time so we did we chose the uh, cemented constraint liner and fixed the trochanter again in this patient but that was not the end of the story Uh, what we see is that patient had a fall again um, uh, and he had a, a fracture of the trochanter on the other side now this side we did not wait for any time and we went ahead and did the uh, the constraint liner on the other side itself um, in the same stage so because this patient was having the recurrent fall which may be because of many reasons the support at home the debility because of his age so we ensure that this patient is able to uh, well and that's what the patient's uh, follow up uh, we can see and this patient was uh, uh, in fact he survived uh, for uh, about 5 years post operative and last uh, last covid wave he uh, uh, we could not save him the other case that i that i'll show the, uh, the another very interesting situation of the constraint liner this patient where we did the uh, total uh, femur replacement and with the total femur replacement we use the constraint liner that's what we we have this patient uh, that's the two weeks post operative and that's the five years post operative where the patient was doing very well he was able to walk without any support and uh, with a with a mild amount of limp which was expected but these patients are the story doesn't end with these patients at this stage because uh, you see that the 
At five years and three months, patient had a fall and he dislocated his hip. Now, may I ask uh, uh, our friends here that what could be the reason of a dislocation and what do you, what do you see the reason for the dislocation of a constrained liner in this case? The, the, the reason was the liner ring was broken and significant was there and these two were the reasons for the failure of the constrained liner. Because these patients are, are very high demand patients because of their age and uh, because when they do a, a surgery like this, they are able to uh, go on in a very good way. Uh, that's what uh, we saw, the the, uh, the broken ring. And that's what this ring was, was changed. And uh, uh, the, again, the same liner was, was used. The, the same custard liner was used and that's what the patient patient's uh, uh, function six months post-operative, the second second surgery. Yeah. Anil, uh, I, I don't think I'll, I'll show more case. No, I think uh, that's a very good display. Uh, just a quick question, uh, Rajiv. I think Arun is next in line. Arun can get his presentations ready. Uh, I think there will be a lot of questions. So, uh, Dr. Suri, I'd like to ask you a comment. Uh, Raj Dr. Rajiv, can you go to the pre-op x-ray for your first case, please? The trochanteric fracture, Dr. Suri. Yeah. yeah. The first one. Yeah. So this situation. Now, uh, how are we for an I mean, uh, 80, 80 year old male fall on fair trochanteric fracture? What would be your go to? Is it a trochant? Is it a bipolar, unsummited bipolar type with fixing the trough fragments? If we go to a THR or do we go for uh, a fixation? What, what, what is our take on? My choice in this case is usually uh, uncemented but bipolar and a good proximal reconstruction. The second okay. important point one can probably talk about is how you approach this. It is uh, okay. you know, rather than doing take a composite both of the abductor along with whatever the bone is attached to the abductor along the quads and then reflect it so that in the abductor composite mass of the vastus trochanter and the gluteus remains as a single sleeve. So when you put the thing in appropriate length and you pull it down, the tissue works as a unitized assembly. And then, of course, you will reattach whatever is required. That if you cut transversely and get into the joint or if you go through the fracture, probably I think uh, you would end up probably devitalizing the tissues much more. So this is what Vijay and myself, we always do. That we take this, the primary uh, thing is to take out. Second, to avoid any dislocation is do not take out the labrum. Do not take off the labrum. Yes. So I think uh, that's a very important message all around. One is I think respect the labrum if you're doing a bipolar, uh, leave the labrum. And I think reconstitution and reconstruction of the abductor mechanism, that is the GT and the LT unit composite with the IT band is very important. Is it Dr. Suri? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Suri, uh, you said that cementless uh, stem or yeah. a cemented stem? We use mostly a cementless and of course, if it is a type 3, DOR 3, uh, DOR C or something, probably one can certainly do. Right. But the cementless, uh, cemented, sometimes if the crack and the displacement is more distal, then it uh, becomes a slightly compromised. And you want, it's a matter of time also in these cases, you are in and out as fast as you can. So a 190. So you are mentioning because device. of the, uh, the cement spilling, the trochanteric union may be yeah. an issue. No, 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 no. More importantly, even your fixation, your lesser trochanter is totally broken down. So you're mm -hmm. going to have a difficile fixation, which is not adequate. And a 190 walk to Wagner to get a fixation drive down doesn't take much time. Uh, I think absolutely. the additional advantage of the Wagner is that also it has an inherently larger horizontal offset. Yeah. Which gives it a better additional stability. That gives a better stability. Better stability. Yeah. Yes. So, I think the message here is in fractures, fractures, you can use a Wagner step 190 or else uh, I use a cemented stem of uh, CPT or a exeter stem which is 150 uh, millimeter. With, with high yeah. offset, with high offset, with high yeah. offset. Even and a cemented but the important high offset two step. Important, two important things that uh, the version and the vertical offset. The other two things one should restore. It is difficult since uh, Kalkar is and the, Correct. Yeah, version <coughs> and the length is uh, important. Uh, uh, Anil, can I ask a question here? That uh, will sure. any of our, our uh, prefer the fixation in the 
age and fraction? Uh, okay, we can have a show. Ajit is smiling. I don't know. Yeah, Ajit, I, I, uh, whether I'm for the right side. You... Because Rajiv, 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 I think that is very important. Yeah. Krishna? 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 For me, all very happy fixation. Krishna, Rakesh. Fixation for me. Yeah. A fixation for me too. This is easy. Nikhil, Nikhil is online. Nikhil, what is your take? If Nikhil uh, can we, hear us or we, we we fix these fractures. We don't do primary total hip for intertrochanteric or subtrochanteric fractures. Yeah, yeah, Sanjeev. Okay. Sanjeev is put it up again. Sanjeev? Yeah, so basically. Previously, I used to do a lot of total hip or the bipolar, whatever the Dr. Suri is advising. Uh, since the time these new AO, PFN and other stuff has come up, I think I practically fix all the fracture and uh, have a good result. I think uh, uh, it's a very tall claim. Rakesh, because, uh, Rakesh? Yeah, uh, Sorry, I just mentioned me. that. Rakesh. So, uh, there are uh, criteria when you would primarily go for an arthroplasty, but that's only a very few exceptional circumstances. The go-to treatment will be fixation. Of course, there are varieties which uh, just Sanjeev mentioned. That's a TFNA has been come out. A uh, very good one where you can even put cement actually through the leakage. It, it, this gives you wonderful and you can mobilize. It's not like you, you can only mobilize with arthroplasty. You can mobilize after fixation also. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. Dr. Suri yeah. is saying something. Dr. Yeah. Suri? In the, in the, I think yeah. the indications when to go, go either way is very well defined today. And it is not that the nail is a be-all, end-all. It is not the bipolar be-all, end-all. But I think there are other factors also that come into play, the whole basic patient profile at that point in time and the morbidity and the other associated factors. We need to put all this together. And fundamentally, if something which can get them up and out as early as possible with no concern, I think yes. it's to go. Right. Well taken. Results well are comparable both ways. Case by case, whatever it is, respect soft tissue anatomy and go ahead. Thank you very much. Anil. Right. But one Anil. thing remains in cases that the uh, mobility is definitely better with the, uh, with the bipolar uh, cemented or cementless. And this patient had a dislocation. But as we all know, uh, for the, especially for the younger uh, colleagues who are there in the webinar, uh, that several uh, other uh, bipolar that are done, uh, they never have a dislocation so much. So it is. It doesn't mean by seeing this case that all bipolars will have its location. Yes. Over yes. to you, Dr. Arun. Arun, are you ready with your presentation? Yes. So, Anil, we by the time Arun comes, I'll just put in a point. If you yes, look at, please. If yes, you look at the published literature, the initial mortality with bipolars is much higher than initial fixation. So, if you have a choice, fixation takes over. Uh, yes, uh, I think Rakesh, you were referring to that uh, that uh, that see that meta that came out recently. I think correct. Yeah, yeah. It's there's a recent one and also one uh, from the uh, Parker series from the uh, Cochrane review. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I think. Yeah, there's yeah. there's a big question which which will remain. Uh, the yes, I think this, this debate will always go on. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we will we'll continue the discussion at the end of this. Okay, go on, Arun. Over to you. Yeah, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Arun, yeah. 64 year old female had a simple uh, femoral neck fracture. So she initially had this uh, uncemented uh, non modular uh, bipolar done elsewhere. And then uh, within two weeks, uh, she uh, you've seen that the stem has subsided and she dislocated. And then, um, so the initial surgeon converted into a cemented hemi to avoid the subsidence. And um, I think the point to note here is that uh, the offset and uh, the offset has not been restored. It looks like a very short offset for this lady. And then um, she again dislocated five days after the revision surgery. So this is, uh, she was like this for a few weeks and then uh, presented to us. Four weeks after the second dislocation, hip was unreduced, uh, wound was okay, and CRP was normal. And uh, I'll go on and finish the case, sir. Yes, yes, please, sir. Yes, go ahead. Probably the stem was uh, in about 15 degrees version. It was well fixed. There was uh, no problem on the acetabular side. Um, the stem was removed. Uh, the cement mantle was healthy. 
So what I chose was uh, whether to do a bipolar or a dual mobility or a primary uh, a regular hip. The bipolar outer shell was 41. Uh, that roughly translates into a cup size of approximately 46 mm. And that would have a dual mobility head outer articulation of about 38 mm. The question that uh, that came to my mind at that point was which would be more stable, whether a 41 mm bipolar or a 38 mm dual mobility. <coughs> But uh, we did go ahead with the dual mobility uh, hip. For the stem side, uh, it was a non-modular stem. So I wanted to revise it to better restore the offset. So instead of uh, doing an uncemented revision that would require uh, an ETO to take out all the cement, we did a cement in cement revision. It was a fairly recently uh, cemented stem. So cement mantle was good. We did a cement in cement revision and a dual mobility uh, socket for this lady. And she continues to do well. It's post op, and this was three months post op, and uh, she's been stable since. The question was uh, dual mobilities have come up as a good answer for uh, unstable hemis, and that is because they have a hemispherical shell as compared to an anatomical uh, uh, socket, which is uh, sub hemispherical. Um, so, even though the bipolar articulation is slightly bigger than the uh, a dual mobility bearing, uh, a dual mobility seems to be more stable than a bipolar. So uh, that is the first uh, thing I wanted to So a restoration of offset, dual mobility, good option for an unstable hemi and cement and cement revision, especially for instability simplifies the stem side part of the revision. Second one uh, is a 24 year old female. Um, she had a spinal neurofibroma or a tumor excised at two years of age. And uh, she came with right hip pain. She had uh, significant weakness on the right lower limb, hips, knees, as well as at the ankle. Of note, uh, her uh, she had three by five hip abduction. The hip extension was even weaker. And this was the picture, 24 year old. Uh, you can see that in adduction, she's already coming out uh, preoperatively. So, so we planned for her with the robotic uh, system. So we've been using the Mako robotics for doing uh, hips. And this is how we plan. We got the spinal x-rays done. We have uh, taken those values into consideration here. So normally we plan for a 40 uh, cup inclination, 20 version. And the uh, native version was 16 and we initially planned for the same. And uh, with the adjustments, you can see that as compared to the opposite hip, we have restored the length and uh, offset is 2 mm increase as compared to the opposite side. So now we, uh, with the Mako system, we can put her through a virtual range of movement. So with 90 degrees flexion and 55 degrees internal, rot internal rotation, she was having an extra articular impingement, what uh, Dr. Suri sir was uh, referring to. The GT was going and hitting against the AIIS. So this is where uh, we were looking for options to correct uh, this. So in this scenario, uh, this is what was happening, the GT going and hitting against the AIIS. So we, I mean, just to illustrate, if you change the cup version, taking into account the combined anti-version, it doesn't change the impingement here. So changing cup version will not correct this extra articular impingement, cup version. So here offset has been already restored, but uh, in the interest of stability, what we did was uh, increase the offset and length. We put in a plus eight head as compared to a zero head, and this made the hip uh, six mm uh, 4 mm longer and 6 mm increased offset, but you can still see this uh, red shadow showing that she is still impinging. So this is where uh, the options were uh, explored. So uh, maybe uh, can I have this one? Uh, uh, anybody can take a uh, call on what next to do. This is all in the pre-planning stage. Uh, no, no, go, go ahead, Arun, and then we will discuss. So. Uh, so we increased the stem version to 25 degrees from 16 degrees, uh, even though the initial combined anti-version was good. And uh, this uh, took care of the external impingement. So uh, what we could conclude from this case was, uh, this was a post-op x-ray. So uh, the stem version accounts for uh, external impingement also, while the cup version does not have anything to do with extra articular impingement. That is one thing that we could see from the CT planning based on the robotic technology. 
So this was the immediate post-op. And uh, this was three months post-op. We have lengthened her a uh, little bit and increased the offset also, but uh, it was a stem version. To gain uh, extra version, we've used the Wagner stem, conical stem to increase the version so that it would go well beyond the NATO version. So the for extra articular bone-on-bone -bone impingement, the corrective measures are increasing the offset and femoral version. It is not affected by the acetabular version. So therefore, we cannot use combined antiversion alone to give protection against extra articular bone-on-bone -bone impingement. Femoral version holds the key here. Yeah, I think. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Arun. Both interesting cases. Uh, can we? Okay, we'll get some questions. I think we'll answer the chat boxes first. Yes. Yes, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, Anil, one thing. Uh, yes. That this the, the dual mobility is a very useful device, and we should yes. just to uh, just to comment that uh, one of the uh, constraint liner we had to revise uh, to a dual mobility, and it has been doing very well. Second, Anil, this uh, this patient was having the impingement at fifty five degrees of abduction, right? No, no, sorry, yes. it was ninety. It was ninety no, no, no. abduction and fifty five degrees internal rotation, neutral abduction abduction. This is like a combined. Right where the patient sits so uh, uh, for uh, the planning purposes 90 and around 55 60 degrees uh, flexion you would like to have without impingement so that they are right. safe yeah. i think arun that's an excellent presentation of that case because uh, i think this Very is nice. exploiting robot to the full you know yeah. the virtual position virtual impingement which we are seeing and which yeah. can it's very difficult to do i think if you can have that detail even before you start I think this is a great tool, very well executed. I think uh, like he clearly mentions uh, that is always a boundary, how much you can do on the socket, how much you can do on the femoral side. When we talk about dual or a constraint, probably you're only adding the system constraints, but that's not a solution, right. a primary situation as much as possible. Uh, especially can, Dr. Suri, yeah, yeah. especially when you can see it uh, virtually before you have actually fixed absolutely, the absolutely. Yeah, I agree. So, Dr. Suri, can I can I quickly ask you if yeah. that is the case? You said there is an upper limit. Yes, the assembler version also there is an upper limit. Even on the femoral side, he antiverted to twenty five degrees. Agreed. Now, agreed. So now, now when we do not have the robot and you're trying to replicate it, say with the trial implant in situ. In all this, I think we should have a trial of the socket and a trial of the stem, and then play around and then do a practically eyeball sort of a situation and then fix it. Yes. Now what happens, we finish so what? for the cup. And then when you come down to the stem, yes, exactly. So is this, is does it come back and to the same uh, dictum that when, when we are in doubt, do the femur first? Yes. Yeah, I think some people do it routinely, but the other way also is true. Correct. I agree with you. Okay. Nikhil's phone was coming in. Okay. Hey, any comment, Nikhil? Yeah, Nikhil. Nikhil, Nikhil, are you there? Yes. So we have, we have, yes, we we have the robot. But I have to say, I'm not very impressed with the robot. We have just revised three robotic assisted total hip replacements for dislocation. But that problem where you get the extra articular impingement. I mean, personally, for for someone who does hips for a living, I don't think you need the robot. Because what all you do is when you're doing a hip finger in deep flexion, ex internal rotation and adduction. And then what I tend to do is you take the trial stem out, you take a Lamborghini osteotome and you take it along the anterior neck and the anterior trochanter, And you basically do what I refer to as a reduction plasty of the anterior trochanter, including the osteophyte. And you almost every case that will sort out your extra articular impingement. The problem with offset is you can offset it to a certain degree, but women particularly, they don't like uh, over offsetted hips. They really moan and they, they're really in pain. Yeah. Um, there was one comment I wanted to make about the constraint cup, particularly that neuromuscular case. So what, what we have observed is that in neuromuscular patients, the forces are so strong that if you don't allow the hip to dislocate in a constrained bearing inside an uncemented cup, particularly in older people, basically the next um, attempted dislocation will rip the cup out of the pelvis. And that is a huge 
extremely difficult uh, problem to solve because you get some irregular fracturing of the acetabulum you sometimes get discontinuity so when i do my discontinuity cases or if i'm doing a custom case i never use a custom line i tell them that you might dislocate a few times and i don't mind that but once the cup is fully ingrown or once i've got good fixation if needed i'll go back in and change it to a dual mobility liner or i'll use a primary dual mobility liner nowadays but we have seen lot of problems with the constraint bearings nikhil you made some so, great so, points nikhil, here can i add uh, anil you have a yes 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 please go ahead yes please go ahead is, i think uh, it's also that uh, sometimes when you have this technology in front of you then we tend to get distracted we think that the whole thing can be solved by this like nikhil said Yes, of course, you can work on reducing the anterior flare of the trochanter and the soft tissues, and then increase it by another five to ten degrees to the satisfactory point. That is one. But then I think we can't take away the the benefits and some things which we were obviously just eyeballing all the time that we have actually a red spot a flash starts flashing red, and you know that that is an issue, and you want to work on it. I think we have to take both sides, and then you know work it. I agree. I agree perfectly, Raksuri. Yeah, Raksuri, what you what you suggested, uh, the the technology. Uh, uh, I agree that uh, the technology has to be learned well and then followed yes. accurately. Yes. So Correct. it's not necessarily that the uh, robotic or earlier time. No, no. What I'm saying is, yeah. no, no. What I was trying to say was, it's not, robot is not needed to size the socket. A robot is not needed to size the stem and where to put. that we all know but what was probably elu- eluding us and then we had this strange sudden dislocations was this type of impingement so pulling it out and today we have a tool which is you know red flagging all these certain things especially in you know, unusual situations deformed morphologies uh, spinopelvic issues which are there i think all these come into play at this time so dr suri uh, uh, if, if we can also uh, we can ask dr nikhil yeah Uh, yes nikhil if you can ask dr does nikhil the, does the robot as the robot also tell you about soft tissue impingement uh, extra articular or only uh, bone to bone predom- predominantly it comes to bone to bone yeah so i'm sure yeah. you have noticed this that when you do lots of revisions yeah 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 it's you do you do get you do get ectopic bone and bone to bone but more commonly you get this dense adherent yeah. anterior yeah. scar tissue yeah. Yes, which is present between the anterior neck and the AIIS. Yes, that's why I said the robot doesn't. The robot doesn't tell you that. So what I like to do is, I take some local anesthetic infiltration with adrenaline. I infiltrate that entire area, yeah, to reduce the the oozing postoperatively, and I basically, you know, excise that tissue using yeah. a diathermy, and then, like I said, take a lamboty and then get rid of the bony impingement. I mean, one case I've even. Um, excised the anterior inferior iliac spine and the reflected head of the rectus and it did not lead to any functional problem i agree uh, uh, i agree uh, anil can i ask dr nikhil uh, because he yes, yes. touched Go upon ahead. a very interesting subject yes uh, nikhil you you mentioned just now that uh, three of the robotic hips you revised uh, so could you please uh, uh, let us know that what were the reason in these cases Uh, trusting the robot too much and keeping your own judgment at home—that was the main reason. <laughs> I think That's you have very, to very be fully aware. Very political statement. <laughs> That's a very important message, I think. Yeah. You know, I think. Uh, sir, 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 Yes, yes, it is use it in combination with technology we should not yes. discount technology but we should not put knowledge ahead of wisdom so whatever we right. have over so many years is still uh, still supersedes uh, the robot or computer or whoever whatever uh, we are uh, using but at the same time we cannot trivialize the information uh, yes. certain yes. situations yes. as we yes. said uh, what uh, spinopelvic uh, uh, and the i think 5% of the hips really benefit from robotics 95% of them don't require uh, all that uh, things but if you don't use it in the 95% you'll not be able to do the 5% one so that's yeah. the catch with anil anil can i quickly present the case uh subhanshu yes okay 
you have a few minutes before we go on to our i think the panelists are uh, waiting for the rest of the discussion and i think we should look at our chat box also we're already yeah. quarter past nine yeah. it's quarter past nine so we have 15 I minutes sign uh, off. it's okay pardon i need to sign off at this time Okay, sir. Thank you so much thank for your you contribution, so Dr. Suri. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Suri. Thank you for joining, okay, and thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you so much. Uh, same, same here, uh, Anil. Sorry, I've reached the school, so I'll need to okay. sign off. But okay, okay, we have. Okay. We, we have uh, thank, you, okay. thank you, thank you, Dr. Suri. Thank you, Dr. Nikhil, and we will continue with the discussion. I think it's only ten minutes more, right, Rajiv? So we'll have yeah, Dr. Subhanshu, so. and we close yeah. in ten minutes for sure. Yes. Yeah. So Subhanshu, your uh, time is five minutes, and then we have five minutes for discussion. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So this is seventy-two years old female homemaker with a little high BMI twenty-nine, no comorbidities, a right cemented bipolar hemiarthroplasty done fifteen years back, and left bipolar. After six months of the right one, so both are almost fifteen years. The revision of the right totally uh, was done uh, outside in August twenty twenty. That means almost fifteen years uh, after the uh, bipolar arthroplasty. But unfortunately, this uh, totally dislocated two weeks after the revision surgery, and presented four months later. And at times, she was non-ambulatory. Those are the X-rays. So the concerns here: what is the type of dislocation? What is the cause of dislocation? And there are two scars of previous surgery. There is greater trochanteric non-union, and what to do? Close reduction, open reduction, revision. Any take on this? No, I think uh, Dr. Subramanian, go ahead and complete. We will we will discuss at the end because we will give room for all the discussion. Okay. So since let us. A different type of case. It would have been better if you would have uh, permitted some discussion. But, uh, no problem. We can. We can. If uh, we can. Okay. We can give two rooms for discussion. No problem. We can give two questions. Not an issue. We have some time. Yeah, yes. Just, just asking. Yes. You. No problem. What is to be? Oh, one of you at least can take this. Okay. First of all, the greater trochanter looks uh, definitely lost its continuity. uh what about the version of the cup because at least in this view the cup version looks uh, to be in question yeah and uh, the cup version it looks a little yeah, open yeah, in this view yeah yeah even yeah. the stem is rotated yeah the stem i'm not sure the stem version or where it's placed any other comments yeah uh Uh, how how to approach this? So, do do a close reduction or? No, you said this is a first dislocation, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now there, but it's, it looks like it's compounded with problems. The GT definitely looks. Uh, we don't know the integrity of the GT. Uh, yeah. Close reduction definitely, but I think uh, it will be worthwhile looking at the version of the components before uh, going in for because this has to be close reduction for now. But definite management would be required with. Uh, Full assessment, right? Okay, so we'll go. Body need to get a CT scan done for this patient. Yeah, CT. So ideally, a CT scan should should be done to know the version of the <clears throat> components. Yeah. So we tried a close reduction, but uh, we failed. And joint aspiration was sterile. ESR fifty six, CRP six point five. So planned for a revision surgery. So these are the AP and lateral X-rays of the hip with the femur, you know, just to look for the X-ray pictures. And uh, we did a CT angio because you know the head of the femur or uh, head of the prosthesis was palpable in the groin, so it was uh, like an anterior dislocation. So we did a CT angio. There are no vascular impingement uh, by the screws, as you can see, the screw is going in. And uh, we did a CT scan, and it showed there's an excessive antiverted curve. So almost uh, around uh, 60 degrees of uh, version of the, you know, antiversion of the curve. So this was an anterior dislocation compared to the routine, you know, whatever we see, a posterior dislocation. So the planning was in for, for this case that uh, we kept a wear removal set because we have to take out those wears. 
we have to have a explant system because you wanted to revise the cup the position of the cup is uh, too much antiwatered moorland and innovate system uh, in case the femur requires revision we kept a multi hole cup constant liner wagner solution stem long cemented and modular stems uh, low grafts also and special standby in case there is a infection so at greater tokenter was not united so we approached through the greater tokenter so that is the acidophilum there and uh, what we couldn't see was there was a constant liner there but the x-ray doesn't show anything and there was excessive antiversion of the cup <coughs> that was the you know uh, line and that is the inclination and antiversion inclination was almost you know 50 60 degree and the uh, version was almost 60 degree anti version of the cup and uh, piece uh, the you no know, removal of the egg, this constant liner was very difficult the ring came out but this to take out this liner it is a really hell of a job though they have some instruments but those are not useful so we have to take out this liner really in piece mill person uh, this a uh, constant liner then extraction of this stem was difficult and it was button holing through the muscle but it was very well fixed cemented stem and the version was also quite okay maybe little more anti version but uh, it looks adequate to me so i didn't revise the stem and uh, used the explant system to take out the cup this is after taking out the cup and put a you know multi hole cup standard cup and that was a final cup position used a elevated liner and the stability was quite good with this primary you know uh, system this is a flexion abduction external rotation and then flexion adduction and internal rotation almost 60 to 70 degree internal rotation it was dislocating so that was the final implant inside and greater trochanter we wired it and uh, grafted it also so that is the post operative x ray for this patient and uh, that is the post operative ct scan just to see the positioning there was uh, almost you know 14.7 degree you know version and uh, inclination was uh, 27 almost nearly you know 30 degree of inclination so that is a follow up of one year the you know there is no further dislocation and patient is walking with the help of a stick there just one or two literatures anterior dislocation is a rare uh, you know phenomenon after the totally replacement it is due to mal positioning of the cup and is associated with approximately 10 degree of excessive femoral and acetabular antiversion respectively immobilization of the hip if you are able to do a close reduction immobilize in 45 degree of flexion 10 to 20 degree of abduction and neutral rotation what is known as deck chair position <laughs> comparison of anterior and posterior dislocation after a posterior approach there was a you know 1 is to 4.6 incidence of uh, posterior to and uh, you know anterior to posterior dislocation so posterior dislocation is almost five times more than the anterior dislocation through a posterior approach this patient had not gone under gone a posterior approach there was strong association between anterior dislocation and anti version of the acetabular cup and femoral stem size of the femoral head and soft tissue tension the higher incidence of post operative posterior dislocation was found to be related to a soft tissue tension revision of arthroplasty and incorrect posture thank you for a patient hearing and this is a one more literature late anterior dislocation due to posterior pelvic tilt in a totally arthroplasty of course here the pelvic acetabular parameters come into picture and because of the kyphosis of the uh, spine uh, degenerative spine there was a late anterior dislocation in this uh, hip when the patient develops degenerative changes in the spine thank you for a patient hearing and those who are the members of ioa there i request and uh, appeal that kindly support in my endeavor with the vice president of ioa the elections will be held from 22nd november onwards thank you thank you anil uh, we have just 6 uh, minutes maximum yeah so i think we can count down 6 minutes and uh, we can take all interesting questions to the panel and question i think first i think we got to answer the questions in the chat somebody had asked for a cement and cement revision and they wanted to know while using a cement and cement revision uh stem should be downsized uh yes i think uh, anybody here dr rajiv or rakesh you want to 
take on yeah. that i can take that a uh, little yes rakesh go yes, ahead Rakesh. yeah so there are two things you need to understand here one is uh, cement and cement revision and one is in cement uh, technique so in in cement technique you basically knock out the stem and you put a new stem but the same company and same size and in cement in cement revision you're going to put in more cement but you downsize one size but you got to be sure that that one size down size is available before you start doing this technique and generally if like you're doing striker stem or something your ap stem is always available to down size that typically does it matter, all, does all it matter? Are available in the yes system exeter system for cement yeah. and cement. Yeah. yeah it does it okay krishna just a quick question when you're doing a cement and cement revision suppose when you're taking out the stem the primary stem you're intending to revise what would be your criteria for observing say the cement mantle cracks in the cement mantle deficiencies in the mantle that you would accept for a cement and cement revision the uh, cement bone interface must not have any lucencies so if there are any lucencies then you must revise it second is the what is the type of cemented stem they have used sometimes i have found that it could be a blade type of stem and then you can't actually put in the smallest available uh, other company stem so sometimes you're forced and also the third issue is like if you are using a very small cemented stem like an exeter or a cpt 00 we must make sure that we can't leave it proud because otherwise it will break the problem with that is sometimes with the largest available head also you'll not be able to restore the correct length and offset for the hip so stability becomes a third concern and fourth is what is the version of the cementing is it acceptable for the combined version of the patient so these are all the four factors but if it's a young patient uh, very uh, well cemented uh, uh, situation in the cement bone interface the version is decently okay then it's the first choice because you are now retaining the uh, post bone so i think the, that that line is very clear so if you are retaining post bone cement mantle is good version is acceptable go ahead with cement on cement but otherwise younger patient you need to change the parameters go ahead to revising the stem or revising the fixation correct krishna yeah yeah we must be prepared okay. to do a uh, eto if required and must also have the equipment to do a <clears throat> endofemoral removal of cement wherever it is possible correct and i think the uh, thing to take home is here uh, you know if your stem is fine but you got to do a last thing on the cup but the stem is coming in way so you basically knock it out and put it back yeah and provide the parameters and everything that you yeah. can restore are within the fixation that you're going to be permitted with the cement and cement yes rakesh very good any other points i think i'm looking at the chat box now uh, rajiv you let me know when it's the 6 minutes are done right so the chat box while using cement there's no other questions in the uh, chat box that i can see for now i think adarsh had a question little early on okay uh, krishna raj kanal any changes in approach in a patient with rigidity or spasticity for example due to parkinsons or stroke uh, who would take that on dual mobility <laughs> no no i think uh, any changes in approach i think that referring to krishna raj was referring to the surgical approach oh, it might If you are the normal approach, use what approach you are familiar with? I don't think you should change approach for. I think you should change that. And if it's with respect to the respect to the fixation, you're saying dual mobility. So approach whatever you're familiar with, fixation, you would suggest dual mobility. Okay. And if it's posterior, you yeah, must open. Posterior, yes, Ronan. If it, if you use a posterior, you must repair. Repair. Okay. And yeah. Anil, I have a question. Yes, right. Yes, I was listening to Sudhir's oh. talk, and uh, one of the things he uh, suggested for preventing um, further dislocations is to put a latch ahead. I just want to ask people who are doing uh, some sort of anti approaches how useful that is for your approaches. Not at all. Not at all. Because see, your head is ultimately dis- dictated by the establer size, so there is there is no. If you can put in, I mean, how much of a usefulness that is to prevent dislocation? So the direct more the head size is getting the parameters right correct krishna direct anterior approach we found that even with a 28 mm head the stability is the same so we don't use any dual mobility if you are using a direct anterior approach always come into play when we are using the posterior approach yeah. uh, so 
for primaries where we are doing direct anterior instability is almost gone out of the picture so anil that's what i was actually so, saying that you know if you do like one of the anterior lateral or anterior approaches then putting larger heads actually doesn't help you too much uh, and in fact if you do things like dual mobility sometimes it's very difficult to do trials because you can't get the trials out what's the lowest size of dual okay. mobility so so ronan this will be the last questions okay. what's the lowest size of dual mobility okay. i think to start from 30 uh, krishna uh, evolute starts from i'm using a company name evolute starts from 30 uh, 40 i think 41 Six is they, they don't have it is 40 they have the symmetric one 46 yes, oh my god that's 44. the problem that i had in my case you have 44 from uh, abilities you have 44 no striker striker is from 44 46 but i'm talking about abilities has smaller sizes because it's a cemented one the 43 is available yes. but they don't have 43 in india they have 45 onwards what abilities abilities 45 onwards yes. but most companies merrill has 44 which say modular dual mobility and also accolade uh, trident has got 44 onwards yeah trident has got 44 onwards uh, uh, anil i think uh, fp has 43 uh, fp has 43 have they launched and bimentum you're talking about they're not it coming yeah, bimentum who are 30 is there from within a few um, just got uh, an oxinium uh, on poly uh, uh, we are one minute uh, crossing the r2 r- hours limit okay sure maybe we can we can have the concluding remarks okay so okay what i can say uh, quickly thank you so much i think dislocation would be a topic that we can go on discussing but i think today we had some very good points thanks krishna thanks for all who joined uh, ronin rajiv i think suri had had some words of wisdom we had a good discussion i think rajiv the the, the take home is that we should have one more on dislocation i think then even then we won't complete <laughs> so this was a very interesting subject uh, uh, and very well uh, taken up by the speakers uh, ronan would you like to close the webinar now yes well th- thank you uh, rajiv uh, for organizing this with the ioa it always helps to have a larger banner and increase the footprint of both ioa and ia and uh, i'd like to thank anil for organizing this at such short notice and for having such a wonderful evening and thanks everyone for taking part and we look forward to seeing you again soon thank you so much thank you everybody good night thank you very much uh, without sending the invitation for our uh, forthcoming uh, iacon 2023 uh, yeah. at uh, chandigarh exactly that's just about what about a week from today 13th right. 15th october right so thank you so much thank you panelists uh, thank, thank you all thank you all for joining just one yes thank you, thank you. so so we are we are off the live stream now rajiv just one thing yes so the next yes, one we do i think we should do it on saturday evening or a sunday morning uh, we just like so we can decide uh, yeah yeah what uh, is the other one uh, uh, there yeah more than say on night we had around 35 i think today yeah 35 was maximum i think we yeah. had so last time we crossed 64 i think yeah so yes, we yeah, uh, think i think we'll get more uh, people saturday uh, or sunday will be a good idea rakesh i don't know what do you say sunday, I think sunday or saturday is better yeah sunday i don't know sunday i think is one day that a lot of people want to spend with the family yeah sunday so, morning is a problem but sunday evening will be better no no saturday is much better I, I think the value Saturdays for our meeting yeah. is that a lot of people watch it whenever it is convenient for them. Uh, so we may not have too many live uh, at any given time. So whatever is the thing, I think uh, uh, we did on Thursday evenings for some times. Then on Saturday, then some people said probably weekend we should not do because everybody will be busy with traveling or like family. Family. But most of our videos I, I see uh, I've seen on the website as well. they have more than mm. 1000 1500 views because they right. be watching on uh, uh, after the actual event has happened right. so the it's, a, it's a very is, useful uh, thing uh, krishna you're right that any any time uh, we can see and the la- and the larger number of the people who are depressed uh, uh, after the uh, webinar yes right. definitely yeah. and we but rakesh uh, point is right that uh, uh, last webinar the number was really good we were, ha- we were very happy which uh, deba had organized deba do you remember 69 yep. 69 was the yeah so so w- w- what was the day deba it was saturday sunday, i think sunday, sunday evening 
Sunday Saturday evening. evening, what is the Apple? Weekend, Saturday evening is a difficult time. But right. uh, and my Sunday morning also is difficult because everyone will be th- with family. Even so, Ronan, you have the last word on it. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think so let's take, try Saturday next. Okay. All right. Done. Uh, Anil, it was a uh, good work and uh, in, in a short time. Thank you. Anyway, good. At least yeah. we had so much of discussion. Good for that. Uh, and thank you, Anil, uh, for joining. Uh, Anil Arora, thanks for joining. Oh, thanks, us. Frank. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you thanks. so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Good okay, night. Good night, everyone. Anil. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.